All right. Well, uh, I have the, I guess, pleasure of uh, starting the last session of the conference. Um, I'm Tim Middleton. I'm a principal consultant with HMMH. Um, we are an environmental consulting firm, and I focus on aircraft noise. Um, and we are, the last session is new entrants. And so new entrants is um, uh, a very relevant topic for this symposium as we look to the future of where the aviation industry is going and the new aircraft and vehicle types, as you recall from the FAA's NPR, they're referring to them, these new entrants as vehicles uh, because some of them are not traditional uh, aviation type aircraft. So. Um, with that, we're going to talk about supersonics, electric aircraft, and eVTOLs, and I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nathan Cruz. Uh, Dr. Nathan Cruz joined NASA Langley Research Center in 2021. His work at NASA focuses on supporting the planning and execution of community noise test campaigns during the Quest mission. Prior to joining NASA, he served as a research mathematical statistician, statistician at USDA's Nat National Agricultural Statistics Service for more than eight years where his research focused on improving crop and economic estimates by combining survey and auxiliary data through statistical models. He holds bachelor's degrees in economics and mathematics, master's degrees in economics and statistics, and a PhD in interdisciplinary programs, all from Ohio State University. Dr. Cruz co-chairs the Federal Committee on Statistical Methodology Interest Group in Computational Statistics and the Production of Official Statistics. So, Dr. Nathan Cruz. Uh, thank you all, and thank you for the chance to be at this wonderful conference. Um, I'm going to share an overview of some of NASA's intentions with the X-59 aircraft, uh, culminating in community testing. And Sandra, if you will, would you go ahead and launch the animation on this uh, slide? And so uh, our focus is on uh, quieting the sonic boom. And so uh, what you see in this animation is that um, the, the sonic boom uh, happens when uh, shock waves uh, form on any object that's traveling faster than the speed of sound. From the perspective of a listener on the ground, it's a loud and perhaps startling uh, impulse noise, kind of like an explosion or a thunderclap. Uh, but crucially, the uh, sonic boom travels with the aircraft for as long as it's in supersonic flight. Uh, so you can imagine this uh, large uh, carpet, if you will, spanning from New York to L.A. if uh, supersonic flight is happening over land. Uh, in part, uh, because of this phenomenon, uh, supersonic flight over land is prohibited. And so that's codified in the uh, sec uh, Part 817 here. Uh, it's a, really a speed limit imposed on any uh, civil aviation, civil uh, aircraft, and uh, prevents people from operating at speeds in excess of Mach 1 uh, without uh, specific uh, clearances from the FAA or without assurances that the sonic boom doesn't reach land. And so what that means is that any prospective commercial uh, supersonic transport uh, could really serve overseas routes as opposed to uh, routes over land. Uh, much has happened, though, uh, since the enactment in 1973. And so there are prospects of uh, design that can quiet the sonic boom. And so this is really what NASA's Quest mission uh, is designed to do. Uh, we're going to fly the X-59 aircraft, uh, gather uh, community response data, and provide that to noise regulators to decide whether the speed limit should be replaced with a noise limit, and if so, at what levels. Uh, in brief, the NASA Quest mission has three phases. Uh, phase one is about building and uh, flying the X-59 aircraft. Uh, this is a one-of-a-kind demonstrator aircraft. Uh, the, the contract to build it was awarded to Lockheed Martin, and we actually expect the first flight of the X-59 uh, later this year in 2023. Phase one is about building the aircraft and proving its flight worthiness to operate within the national airspace system. Uh, subsequently, in phase two, uh, to be uh, conducted starting in 2024, uh, we're going to spend some time validating the acoustic tools uh, that, that we are developing to measure a one-of-a-kind phenomenon, uh, the quiet sonic boom, or as we like to call it, the sonic thump. 
Uh, so phase two is about uh, proving the, the accuracy of the predictive tools. And finally, phase three, which is my focus at NASA and what I'll spend the rest of the time on, uh, is about the conduct of community testing. Uh, we expect to overfly four to six communities uh, in the nation uh, to gather response data to uh, the, the low uh, the sonic thump and ultimately deliver uh, these data to uh, noise regulators. And I'll identify uh, who the regulators are in the next slide here. Uh, of course, regulatory authority in the United States belongs to the FAA. And I'll point to uh, Section 181 of the FAA Reauthorization Act, which exhorts the uh, administrator to exercise leadership in the development of standards uh, as they relate to uh, prospective uh, supersonic flights and uh, to work with national and international stakeholders as well. Uh, a natural place for that to take place is in the uh, Committee on Aviation and Environmental Protection, a special committee within the International Civil Aviation Organization, and uh, specifically uh, within some of the noise working groups uh, in uh, CAPE. FAA is the U.S. representative uh, to that committee, and uh, NASA is serving in the role of a technical advisor to the FAA in that capacity. Um, I do want to emphasize once again, though, the, the purpose of our mission is really going to be to collect a body of data that can inform the standards that will be uh, discussed and agreed upon uh, by the FAA and uh, the, the regulatory bodies at CAPE. Uh, so let's go ahead and meet the noise source. Uh, we're excited about the X-59 demonstrator aircraft and uh, some of the properties that it has. Um, it's been developed to have an acoustic signature and energetic characteristics like prospective uh, future commercial supersonic transports. Uh, here you see uh, noise levels on a uh, perceived level metric scale in decibels. And uh, we can compare that to uh, some other known phenomenon to, to get a sense of what kind of reduction in noise uh, future transports might have. Uh, compared to the Concorde, which had a 105 decibel uh, perceived level noise, uh, the X-59 is designed to deliver doses, uh, noise levels around 75 decibels and, and some variation in that range. Uh, but you can see compared to uh, a thunderclap or a car door uh, slam inside the car, uh, which could be very startling, uh, the X-59 may have properties that are a little more tolerable a little less startling uh, to communities as it flies overhead. Uh, related to the scope of the Quest mission, uh, I wanna be very clear about uh, what we think we will produce and no less importantly, uh, what's out of scope for the mission. Uh, our intentions here are to produce nationally representative uh, dose response curves. You see kind of a cartoon of what that might be on the uh, right-hand side here. Um, and in particular, we're interested in, in, in two phenomena, uh, the uh, annoyance that is a result of any single flyover, as well as the uh, cumulative behavior. Uh, how do people respond to multiple flights per day? Um, additionally, we'll ask survey questions that will help us capture some of the effects of uh, other things that might attenuate or uh, Increase annoyance. In particular, we'll be asking about the presence or absence of rattle, vibration, or uh, startle that the uh, survey participant experienced, as well as gather some information about their listening environment. Were you at home, at work? Uh, were you indoors or outdoors? Were your windows open when you were indoors? And we'll be able to uh, vary doses within the uh, waking hours of the day, in particular. Uh, so we will be able to have at least a little bit of variation with respect to time of day. Uh, but I do want to highlight that a few things are out of scope for the mission. Uh, in particular, uh, we won't be assessing the effects of sleep disturbance. We won't be conducting overnight flights. Uh, in part, this is a safety consideration uh, with our one and only X-59 uh, aircraft. Uh, also, we won't be focusing on gathering data for takeoff and landing noise. And uh, we won't be focusing specifically on high altitude emissions uh, with the uh, Quest mission. However, I will highlight that other parts of NASA are actively researching these things and supporting research in these areas. 
Um, uh, if you look to the top uh, figure there, you see an example of what we call the poster or the potential sonic thump exposure region. And you get some idea of what a notional flight path might be. Uh, the gray arrow indicating the uh, straight line supersonic cruise and the, uh, the blue return arrow indicating uh, kind of a subsonic loiter if, it, uh, if the X-59 makes an additional uh, pass over the area. See distinct regions for acceleration onto condition and deceleration. And really right there in the middle is where we believe we'll be able to effectively uh, measure or estimate the uh, resulting sonic thump. And it's going to be in that area that we draw our, our sample for this study. Uh, NASA intends to conduct four to six uh, over community overflights uh, starting in 2025 and operating through 2027. Uh, I can announce that the first airfield has been chosen. Uh, specifically, that's going to be in the vicinity of NASA Armstrong and uh, Edwards Air Force Base, the purple dot you see in Southern California. And uh, future airfields are to be determined. Uh, the community to be tested will be somewhere within a 100 uh, mile radius of the chosen airfield. And uh, we have some pretty extraordinary constraints uh, that dictate where we could conceivably uh, conduct these community overflights. Uh, the X-59 is an experimental aircraft. Uh, we have to have adequate one runway and infrastructure, as well as uh, backup airfields uh, in the case of emergency landing. Um, this is also part of the discussion surrounding uh, representativeness of the data that we are to collect. And uh, namely, uh, my colleague Will Dobler has a paper uh, indicating that uh, some geographic variation uh, could uh, change the perceptual experience uh, that on average the, the mean dose will be higher in the northern climates and the mean dose will be smaller in southern climates but subject to more variability. Uh, likewise, we're dealing with the communities uh, present at these test sites and so uh, judicious choice of test site uh, also goes some way into building in the demographic uh, diversity that we that we want in a nationally representative data set. Uh, nobody blink here for a second. And so you can see uh, kind of how a survey might unfold here. Uh, we'll be conducting uh, multiple repeated surveys, um, including single event and end of day attitudinal surveys. And we have a near real time need for uh, data collection uh, as we're trying to conduct upwards of 100 passes uh, over the course of a month. Uh, so we'll be using internet and smart, smartphone survey apps to uh, deploy our surveys. Uh, just to, to be very clear, the population under study will be all residents in that uh, rectangular recruitment region. And you can see uh, some of our intentions about how we'll go about collecting a sample. Um, right now, a notional sample of about 1,000 um, uh, to be collected in each community. Uh, but we start from a sorted list of households, uh, taking every nth household, and then randomly selecting a qualified participant within the household to get the uh, study participant. Uh, in brief here, I'll summarize some of the activity around our noise exposure and design and estimation and analysis. And so first of all, uh, we, we've uh, come to understand uh, more about the uh, ranges that we anticipate uh, producing uh, with the X-59, our nominal doses should range between 70 and 87 decibels on the PL scale. A uh, optimization tool has been developed to help us optimize the noise exposure scale. And uh, we've de uh, developed a sense of the meteorological data that we also need as inputs into our physical models for noise. Uh, a bespoke system of ground recording uh, instruments is uh, being developed. You see uh, kind of the notional diagram up there on top. And we have a strategy for combining uh, predicted noise models with actual measured estimates. Uh, going to be deploying, you know, something like 100 recording units uh, across that large testing area. And so the combination of prediction with measurement will become our dose estimate. Um, I'm nearing the end of my time here, so I just want to highlight what we think we might see uh, based on some early testing that was done in the vicinity of Galveston. Um, this was done using an F-18 aircraft and a special dive maneuver that kind of simulates the phenomenon of a uh, quiet sonic boom. 
Um, in particular, the data came uh, 5,000 records from 371 uh, unique survey participants. And you can see that uh, annoyance was a fairly rare event, even among a group of participants who agreed to take your survey. They know you're doing this testing. In fact, 56% of those cases, they indicated that they couldn't hear the event in question. Uh, more detail uh, are available in the contractor reports, as well as um, one of the academic papers by Lee. And it's been a long time in the making uh, getting to the Quest mission. And in fact, one of the earliest uh, uh, risk reduction studies was done in 2011 in the vicinity of Edwards Air Force Base, again, using the F-18 aircraft. And so here you see uh, two dose response curves from two different communities using the same aircraft and using the same uh, uh, maneuvers. And you can find more details in the contract report and again, in Jasmine Lee's 2020 paper. Uh, I'll just highlight that at the highest ends of the QSF-18 dose range, there's about a uh, two percentage point difference in annoyance. So while they are similar, they're not exactly the same. And so uh, just by way of analogy here, uh, we've seen the FAA uh, Neighborhood Environmental Study and uh, the combination of results from 20 different airport neighborhoods to produce one uh, national dose response curve. And so this will be similar to our objectives with the Quest mission and the community testing to combine data from four to six uh, different communities and produce a nationally representative dose response curve. Uh, I'll highlight that the, the noise metric in question is different. Um, we'll be considering impulse noise rather than uh, the, the cumulative metric here. Uh, but uh, the fact remains that we'll be seeking ways to uh, combine data from multiple communities that we overfly. And uh, just to conclude, I've given you a whirlwind tour of the Quest mission and its intentions to conduct community overflights uh, with the X-59 aircraft. We expect the uh, first flight later this year and we'll begin the community testing in earnest in 2025. And uh, the fundamental research question that we're trying to ask is, should that uh, speed limit on uh, supersonic flight over land be replaced uh, with a noise-based limit and at what limits? Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Um, for our next presenter, uh, we're gonna continue on the supersonics, but talk um, a commercial supersonic operator, uh, Dr. Akshay Oshak is Sustainability and Regulatory Specialist at Boom Supersonic, where he aims to advance Boom's mission of sustainable supersonic travel by increasing understanding the impact of supersonics on the environment and then building solutions to mitigate those impacts. Topics of active investigation include sustainable aviation fuels, aircraft engine design and performance characteristics, modeling of climate impacts and environmental standard setting. Akshay leverages skills and experiences gained from his previous work as an environmental consultant at Ramble and during his graduate research work on aerospace and the environment to make sustainable supersonic travel a reality. Dr. Ashok has earned his master's and PhD degrees in aeronautics from MIT and his undergraduate degree in aeronautics from Purdue University. And I'd remind people um, if you have questions to go through the Slido app to ask questions for the presenters at the end of their presentation. So Dr. Akshay. Super, thank you, Tim. And uh, just want to say it's been a pleasure, um, you know, being able to participate in uh, the NES this year. Um, you know, thanks for having us over and uh, uh, giving us giving me the opportunity to share a little bit with you about uh, my company, Boom Supersonic, um, and uh, kind of focusing on ways uh, that you know we're really looking at impacts uh, to the environment, both uh, you know full flight as well as really honing in on um, uh, local impact. So the talk here, uh, so the, the talk here is kind of two uh, segments, if you will. Um, the first is just a little bit more of an introduction about uh, Boom Supersonic and then and the product that we are developing. Um, and then I wanted to share a little bit uh, with you about our efforts uh, to uh, mitigate uh, local noise impacts, so LTO um, impacts around the airport community. So those will be the two focus areas. Um, I'll touch on the other sustainability efforts that uh, we, you know, we as a company are uh, bringing forth in this vehicle design. Um, but uh, certainly if you know, there are other specific questions on other areas, you know, we can kind of talk offline as it were. Um, 
So, so advancing this, I want to begin kind of, you know, with the thesis for the company, right? So, you know, air travel, uh, you know, connects the world, links um, economies, um, you know, enables people to uh, kind of experience new cultures. Um, and as you can see, you know, intercontinental travel uh, really has progressed over the decades. So if you kind of, you know, look at the chart, uh, on the right here, it kind of shows the evolution between, you know, 19th century steamship travel across the ocean, uh, progressing to propeller um, uh, um, uh, and piston engine aircraft, um, and then the subsonic aircraft uh, developed uh, in the 1960s and then on. And what you'll note is there's really approximately a doubling of speed with, with each new uh, technological generation. And so at Boom, uh, you know, we see kind of new possibilities um, by making further advancements um, into the speed of travel. Uh, so definitely increased productivity in terms of business trips, um, you know, unlocking cities that were, you know, maybe a, a once in three year, once in four year destination can now become more accessible. Um, and I think fundamentally, we believe that life uh, happens in person. And so, you know, long distance relationships are, you know, facilitated, uh, certainly have a lot of other uh, you know, medical related benefits, um, you know, geopolitical benefits, so on and so forth. Um, and so it, Overture um, is the kind of main product or the, the product that uh, Boom is developing. Um, it's the world fa world's fastest airliner. Um, and I think the kind of top tagline there is something that, you know, I'm really kind of proud about uh, and, and passionate about both, you know, both myself and others in the company. So it's optimized for speed, safety, um, and you'll note, you know, sustainability, which I think is, you know, kind of baked into the very core of, of, of how we operate as a company. Uh, so a little bit of, of facts about the aircraft uh, that we're developing. It's a Mark 1.7 aircraft, uh, roughly twice the speed uh, of uh, current uh, um, uh, transport, um, uh, commercial transport aircraft. Um, a capability of carrying 65 to 80 passengers, uh, 4,215 nautical miles. Um, and, uh, you know, a little bit about the, uh, you know, the other aspect of sustainability here, which is on climate impacts, uh, we are designing both the aircraft and the engine, so the entire uh, system to be able to run on 100% SAF. Um, it uh, uh, and, and you can see there are some of the design features here that, uh, you know, kind of uh, take uh, leverage um, advancements in vehicle design and, and development capabilities that have um, been unlocked over the over the years uh, for us to be able to increase the efficiency of the aircraft. Uh, Introduce you to Symphony, which is our uh, engine program for uh, Overture. Um, again, you know, efficiency, sustainability uh, is, is kind of uh, key key drivers here. Um, you know, the, the, the focus is kind of making it affordable for operators to, to operate the aircraft. But then also you'll see here, you know, a very, very strong focus on the uh, noise impact. So things like, you know, single stage uh, fan up front to minimize fan noise, um, you know, enabling uh, 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 um, uh, kind of op ability to operate on 100% SAF. Uh, is a key one. You'll note uh, there are no afterburners here. So that's, I think, a very big uh, design uh, choice that, that we've consciously built in to be able to mitigate um, local airport noise impacts. Um, and uh, the vehicle itself, including the engine, but also more broadly, is being designed uh, to meet uh, uh, the most latest uh, current noise levels. Um, so, you know, what's what's currently, uh, uh, you know, regulated for a subsonic aircraft is, uh, you know, ICAO Chapter 14 or FAA Stage 5 noise levels. Um, for supersonics, uh, you know, we, we kind of see that uh, we don't want to regress to kind of the existing regulations, as it were, which, which mandate much older levels. So we want to kind of start out by at least meeting uh, what's 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 the state of the what's state of the art um, uh, as of today. And so uh, from here, I'll, you know, hoping to share a little bit more about our, our design philosophy and, and, and ways that we are designing Overture to be able to uh, meet uh, these LTO noise levels. So, uh, you know, like I said, we are committed uh, to ensuring that the aircraft and engine uh, combination achieves Chapter 14 levels. Um, we do have a little bit of a unique challenge here, though. So you know, traditionally for, for you know, subsonic um, aircraft development, uh, specifically looking at the engines, uh, you know, 
one of the more more direct ways uh, to reduce uh, LTO noise is to increase uh, the bypass ratio. So derive more of the thrust from the fan rather than the core of the engine. Um, as you can see on the picture here, though, uh, supersonic flight has, you know, the, the physics are fundamentally different. And uh, there is this aspect called wave drag, which, you know, are all so the drag caused by all of these shock waves uh, that you kind of see depicted on this picture. Um, and, and that scales as a function of cross-sectional area. So what you, what you might imagine now is we have, uh, you know, for efficiency of the aircraft, we have a constraint on how big the engines can actually be made. Um, and so that then means that for uh, for 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 the you know as a design constraint we are kind of looking at medium bypass ratio engines. The you know flip side of that is uh, relative to current technology and the way that aircraft are currently operated. Uh, those engines, uh, because you're deriving more of the thrust from the core, um, you have a higher core velocity and therefore a higher uh, jet noise from the from the engine. And so. Our, you know, I mentioned before, you know, we we are targeting chapter 14 levels, and so there have been a number of innovations that uh, we, we we've had to implement, we've had to pioneer uh, for us to be able to achieve that, and so that, uh, you know, is, is is kind of what I'll share with you on the next chart. So three buckets here: um, engine cycle, advanced procedures, and uh, you know, design of the aircraft and engine. So when we talk about the engine cycle. Uh, you know, I mentioned the kind of jet noise is one of the big drivers. Uh, you know, a design constraint for us is to ensure that the exhaust um, a velo mark or the exhaust uh, jet velocity um, has ex has a, a cap to it, and and to make sure that that's uh, subsonic, so that you, you know we eliminate um, a lot of the uh, supersonic shock cell noise just from the jet, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, typically what you might think of uh, for supersonic engines is you have, you know, this long tail that you can see, um, you know, uh, uh, Symphony is designed not to have that, so it's a non-afterburning uh, engine as well. Um, I'll get to the advanced procedures in just a bit, but just to touch on the third point, I mean, you know, it kind of goes through to some of the design uh, characteristics uh, that are baked into the aircraft and engine. So we're really doing a lot of work to uh, evaluate different, uh, you know, nozzle and 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 uh, inlet configurations uh, to be able to uh, minimize, uh, you know, some of the kind of tonal frequencies and such. Um, and then I think the the key the key thing here is our uh, use of uh, what's called the variable noise reduction system or VNRS. Um, and you'll see on the chart uh, that's depicted below a notional takeoff uh, trajectory profile uh, for overture. And so, you know, at, at its short, what this really is, is an automated system uh, that both commands um, thrust reduction, uh, as well as aircraft configuration changes. So changes in the flap uh, settings and things like that uh, during the takeoff uh, procedure. Um, and so this is something that we're pioneering. It's been able to, you know, both minimize, uh, uh, you know, LTO noise, both from a certification perspective, um, but then, uh, you know, in order to achieve the chapter 14 levels. Uh, but then also, you know, we are kind of looking at tuning that, uh, optimizing it for different uh, population exposure maps as well. And of course, you know, we are uh, at the design development stage of the aircraft. Um, uh, I forgot to mention this previously, but our, uh, you know, first flight is uh, scheduled, uh, anticipated to be in 2027 with certification by the end of the decade. And so at this stage of uh, aircraft development, you know, we have a whole bunch of models, a whole bunch of, uh, you know, software uh, that, that's used to calculate um, both the aircraft performance as well as the uh, aeroacoustics. Um, and so those would really, you know, have, have to be validated against, uh, against something in order for us to have confidence that, you know, A, it's, a, the aircraft is doing what we expect it to do, and B, to increase confidence in the validity of our simulation. Um, and so, you know, you'll see some examples here of our um, uh, in-house uh, aero, computational aeroacoustics models. Uh, but then also, very importantly, you know, we, we, we have undertaken a number of wind tunnel tests um, and plan to do so in the future um, in order to kind of, again, you know, close the loop in terms of validating, uh, you know, our designs and what our models uh, predict the, the impacts to be. Uh, and finally, just a quick note on our, uh, you know, overflight or, um, you know, sonic boom impact. So uh, our business case, Overture's business case, is really looking at uh, transoceanic routes. And so 
you know, from our calculations, we kind of see that the market is ripe uh, for more than 600 routes that are viable for supersonic transport. Um, and so what we uh, are very kind of mindful of, and again, it's it's one of those uh, things that's baked in right from the start, uh, is to respect, uh, like, uh, you know, Dr. Cruz mentioned, the um, overland speed limit, um, and notably, you know, uh, eliminating sonic boom impacts to communities over land. Uh, and so, you know, there's a good amount of effort within the company to develop fleet planning and route optimization tools, which, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, objective is to get from point A to B, but to do so in a way that minimizes the amount of fuel that's required, uh, but also ensuring that uh, sonic boom impacts both primary boom as well as things that are reflected off of the atmosphere uh, do not impact uh, land masses at all. Um, and so, you know, just to wrap up, I mean, you know, if uh, uh, I wanted to really get the message across that, you know, even though Overture is still in the design development stage at this point, uh, sustainability is kind of a key thread that runs through the company. Uh, and so noise is one of one of the most critical design dr drivers that, uh, you know, um, go into the decisions that we make uh, um, for designing the aircraft. And so uh, the goal is to be able to achieve chapter 14 noise levels uh, through the these innovations um, that, that I've just covered. Um, one of the key things that, you know, uh, we, we hope that the contribution is not just for Overture, but also more broadly, is that there, there, is, uh, there appears to be a good uh, viability for some of these technologies to then also be potentially applied to subsonic aircraft. Um, and then finally, as I just mentioned, uh, the sonic boom impact um, is something that, you know, we are very firm about that not having any impacts on the land uh, or to land masses. So that concludes it. Um, thank you for your time and uh, allowing me to share a little bit with you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashke. We're going to transition now and we have one virtual presenter with us. Well, not with us, but he's virtually here. So we're gonna get him up on the screen here. And that is Joseph Oldham. He is the president and CEO of New Vision Aviation. He is a native of the San Joaquin Valley and he's been a private pilot since 1974. He's had a passion for aviation since early childhood. A graduate of California State University, Fresno, Mr. Oldham has spent most of his professional life working to improve air quality in the region through deployment of clean energy and clean vehicle technology. Mr. Oldham is president and CEO of New Vision Aviation. It's a 5013C nonprofit charitable organization, and it's focused on providing aviation education for youth and residents of communities of color and low-income neighborhoods in the San Joaquin Valley. Mr. Oldham is the lead pilot and project manager for the Sustainable Aviation Project, designed to validate operations of electric aircraft and has over 230 hours of flights in the Pipistrel Alpha Aero Electro Aircraft. This is the first production electric aircraft in the world. Uh, the project is beginning the process of getting the public familiar and comfortable with electrical propulsion in aircraft as a step towards the advanced electrical powered aircraft or aerial sky taxi vehicles of the future, and larger commercial electrically powered aircraft. Mr. Oldham is a contributor to the NASA white paper published in 2021 on the potential for regional air mobility using advanced electric aircraft to change how underutilized regional airports can bring enhanced mobilities to the communities they serve. Please help me welcome Thank Joseph. Thank you. Appreciate it. I enjoy, uh, I wish I could be there with everybody today, but um, unfortunately, uh, challenges with my schedule have prevented, prevented me from getting up there. So if I can get this thing to show the full, yeah, oh well, I'm not gonna bother. So um, in 2018, we uh, received four Pipistrel Alpha Electros. And it was part of a project that we had designed, uh, developed basically to uh, show the viability of electric propulsion in aircraft. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley has a rich history of aviation. Um, it was a main training area for pilots uh, prior to and during World War II. We have a lot of general aviation airports in the valley, um, basically about 32 of them between uh, Sacramento and Bakersfield. And the weather here is almost ideal for flight training. So the goal of this project was really to see what electric aircraft could do in terms of lowering cost 
for as uh, was mentioned, our primary focus is working with youth from our communities of color, which have been really excluded in to large degree from the aviation industry from getting into high paying aviation jobs because of the cost barrier. Um, and so we know that aircraft, training aircraft, uh, Cessnas, uh, Pipers, uh, and whatever training aircraft you, you kind of choose uh, are pretty expensive to operate. And so the cost for flight training has steadily risen. So the idea bit was basically, okay, let's see if what these electric aircraft, because we know uh, based on uh, deployment of electric vehicles in general, electric cars, buses, et cetera, that electric propulsion has a huge uh, cost savings uh, in terms of cost of operation and maintenance costs. So we wrote a grant and we were successful at getting funding uh, to the tune of about a million dollars, which allowed us to acquire four Pipistrel Alpha, Alpha Electros. Uh, we took delivery of them in March of uh, 2018. And we started the process of testing and validating these aircraft and seeing how they would integrate into an existing flight training operation. Now, we ran into a, uh, one major barrier with uh, Pipistrel aircraft was the way the regulations uh, are written around electric propulsion for aircraft that are classified as light sport. Light sport aircraft is defined as having a single reciprocating engine if powered. An electric motor obviously is not a reciprocating engine. So we set about working with the FAA to put forth a petition for exemption to allow us to use these aircraft for flight training operations. And um, it's taken about four to five years now to for them to finally kind of get around to working on that petition. But in the meantime, we had a lot of testing to do and a lot of validation work to do, which we would have done anyway, because this is all new tech. So we started flight operations uh, basically in 2018. Initially, uh, we were doing a testing program to acquire data for the FAA to help support our petition for exemption. Um, we set up charging infrastructure at three airports, uh, Mendota Airport off to the west, uh, Fresno Chandler, which is you see kind of the center of these operations, and then over in Reedley's Airport uh, off to the east. And all of these airports were within range of the Alpha Electro um, with a full charge. And so we operated the, we've operated these aircraft now uh, to all of these airports and even beyond. Um, back in 2021, I took an Alpha Electro and I flew it from Fresno to Lodi near Sacramento, uh, kind of hopscotching up the valley, doing about 35 nautical mile trips at a time and charging the aircraft up using um, solar powered uh, electric car chargers, which are portable, and we could actually move them along. The Beam, uh, Beam uh, Corporation provided those at no cost to us, and it was an attempt to show how you can actually fly electric airplanes using solar power to recharge them. And when it was very successful, we covered about 200 and almost 230 nautical miles. So as I said, we've, uh, we got the aircraft in March of 2018. I personally have accumulated over 220 hours of flight time in them. Uh, we've traveled well over 3,000 nautical miles with the aircraft. Uh, the aircraft have been flown by a variety of folks um, in the aviation you know, industry, professional airline pilots. The FAA actually sent a test pilot out to fly with me for three days in the aircraft. They've been evaluated by engineers from the FAA and many aircraft companies that have been developing electric, advanced electric aircraft have actually come and visited and sent some of their people to uh, fly with us in the aircraft. And we were doing this as all part of our test program uh, for the FAA and for our petition. In that cross-country flight in 2021, using the solar power, um, I covered about almost 228 nautical miles, used about 66.4 kilowatt hours of power, and um, our fuel economy was about 3.43 nautical miles per kilowatt hour. And that was at a very economical speed of about 60 knots. The aircraft has a really broad range of uh, flight uh, operations. It can fly as slow, I think it stalls at something like 43 knots and can cruise it up to 108 knots. So it has a big range of uh, operation. And we found that the most economical 
speed for it was the best L over D speed at about 64 knots. So some of the community benefits that we have observed and have been uh, you know, kind of obvious from having the aircraft, you have no engine run up. You don't, there is a run up area, of course, at most airports for um, aircraft, the piston engine aircraft. Uh, typically you go to the run up area, you run the engine up to you know, about half power. You check the mags to make sure that they're working properly. And all of this creates noise. And of course, burns fuel and um, in many cases, waste time for the students that are using the aircraft. In the Alpha Electro, you don't do any of that because you have no mags. You don't have to wait for any oil to get warm. Um, none of the typical things that you have to do with a piston engine airplane. Um, one of the most disconcerting things for pilots is when they first get in the aircraft and they and you start it up, the prop doesn't move. But then when you go and stop, the prop stops and they're not used to seeing that. And that's actually kind of funny uh, when I take when I've taken people with me and um, that's their, one of their most uh, common reactions like, oh, my gosh, the prop stopped. Oh, my gosh, it's quiet. We can actually talk in this thing. That's amazing. Um, observers on the ground have noted that the aircraft are absolutely silent at a thousand feet above ground level. And that's uh, really cool for the community. Fresno Chandler Airport is actually surrounded on about three sides by residential neighborhoods. And um, the people in this community for decades have uh, expressed their concerns with the noise that this aircraft, that this airport produces. And as you may be aware, that's a common problem now is uh, residential neighborhoods are beginning to encroach what used to be airports that were actually out in the country. Uh, Reed Hill View is a prime example of that, as well as uh, Santa Monica Airport down in Los Angeles and a number of them. And that's a threat to the continued survival of these airports. Uh, electric aircraft actually can be a great way to eliminate or uh, seriously significantly mitigate uh, that noise uh, nuisance for the community around those airports. We did some noise testing for the electros uh, as part of our petition for exemption. We recorded a 71 decibel reading uh, during full power takeoff, uh, measured about 275 feet from the runway center line. Uh, we compared this to uh, typical training aircraft that are, were also operating that day, uh, Cessna 172s, uh, Piper Cherokees, uh, they all recorded a, a decibel reading of about 80 decibels. We even had a few King Airs that were taking off and they were recording a reading of a, over 90 decibels. So um, significantly less uh, noise from the, uh, the electric aircraft on takeoff. And the primary source of that noise is the propeller. As, as you move, as the propeller obviously spins, it produces uh, a noise signature as it cuts through the air, and that's where you get most of the noise. The actual electric motor just makes a kind of a whirring sound. They, from the ground, most of the time, people have noted they sound like very, very quiet little turbines taking off. So the crew benefits, noise levels in the uh, cabin are low enough that you can actually reduce, remove your headset and talk. Uh, without having to yell or scream at each other, which is really cool. Um, they are very smooth and um, flight inside of an electric airplane is extremely relaxing. Um, I had to do 100 hours of endurance testing on one of these aircraft and um, did a lot of flights, back-to-back um, -back flights over a few period of a few months. And um, it, I, oftentimes it would get so relaxing up there that I kind of like, oh my gosh, I might fall asleep up here. This is not good. So um, they are a, a very relaxing environment uh, to be in for the crew. Some of the potential risks though are if, you know, people around airports are used to hearing engines and used to hearing aircraft uh, as they move. Uh, because the electros or electric aircraft do not produce any initial noise at startup, um, it can be a hazard to people that want to walk up to the airplane, maybe not thinking that either the aircraft is occupied or that the aircraft is getting ready to start. The uh, Alpha Electro actually has a special switch for the prop for the throttle. 
uh, you can't, if you activate uh, the throttle switch and the throttle is actually moved off of its uh, zero position, the prop will not turn. You actually have to move the throttle back to uh, the shutdown detent and then move it ahead for the prop to actually turn. Uh, we've set, we set up some procedures where we basically turn all of the lighting on before we start the aircraft. And then of course, we announced that we're about to uh, start, you know, clear prop before you start to move. Um, and, you know, that seems, that seems to have been working out just fine. People on the ramp areas, however, may not hear you as the plane is even taxiing. They are that quiet. And so you have, the pilot needs to be very aware that the aircraft is very quiet and uh, take appropriate precautions. Uh, if they see some, if you see somebody walking or moving uh, that might not understand that the aircraft is there, then you basically want to just shut it down and let it coast and um, make them, you know, be as cautious as you possibly can uh, with people out on the ramp area. So with that, um, if there's any questions, um, I'll answer those later on. This is an image of taken as we were coming into land at Modesto. Uh, many of our Valley airports are surrounded by residential communities. And so electric aircraft are going to be a big benefit for operations in the San Joaquin Valley. And so, uh, as well as I think they will be in many, many, many parts of the, uh, the rest of the country. So thank you very much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share what we've learned from actually having these aircraft for now for about five years. Great, thank you, Joseph. It was great to have a GA perspective on our panel. And I would like to introduce our final speaker and the final speaker of the conference, the coveted, coveted spot that Ben Goldman has. He's the manager of acoustics at Archer. Ben began his career with Bell Helicopter, where he spent five years improving their acoustical prediction methods, as well as learning field test and civil certification procedures. Prior to joining Archer, Ben spent two years at Joby Aviation, leading the aeroacoustic aero design of their vehicle. His current responsibilities include leading design of the cabin and external noise profiles for Archer's production vehicle, Midnight. Ben holds a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Purdue University and a master's degree in aerospace engineering with a focus on aeroacoustics from the Pennsylvania State University, where he studied under Kenneth Brentner. Please help me welcome Ben Goldman. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your focus uh, on this last most exciting presentation. Uh, just status check. How many people in the room have heard of Archer Aviation? Wow, that's awesome. I was, I'm surprised. All right, great. Look here. So today uh, I will be talking about designing urban air mobility for low noise. Let's get started. So who we are, uh, like I said, I was a little surprised you guys know who we are, but for those of you who don't, uh, we have now designed and we are manufacturing a safe, sustainable, low noise, all electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft with the goal of being first to market in 2025. Uh, there's a lot of adjectives in that statement. Uh, the big one to start with is the all electric vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, so we shorten that to eVTOL. Uh, and so I'll use that term probably a couple of times through the rest of the talk, but that's the one to familiarize yourself with. I'll cover the rest of them as we go. All right, so the first part, the eVTOL, electric. Um, it is the advancement of electrification that has enabled this technology first and foremost. Uh, we have seen tremendous growth uh, in the specific energy density of batteries over the last uh, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, in particular, in the last few years alone, we have reached a so-called magic number of about 250 kilowatt hours per kilogram, which uh, basically enables this technology to be a viable business model. The other way to consider that, though, is that we have only just reached the point of market viability. So we are at a razor's edge of having a product that will actually make a profit. So we need to be keenly focused on actually making a product that is efficient, that will allow us to make money and profit as a business. So a little overview, uh, Archer UAM, this is the urban air mobility concept uh, as we are building it out. 
Uh, we plan to move people less than 100 miles uh, within and around city centers. The early launch markets, you may have uh, heard a couple of the announcements thus far, uh, New York, Chicago, LA, Miami, largely congested areas, areas that are dealing with uh, high throughput and, and need solutions for these uh, high congestion areas. Uh, the early launch routes will be these trunk routes. Uh, so basically the main routes that go from airport to city center. Uh, there's already an, an existing demand and a willingness to, to pay. Um, I can add to that that there is also a, to some extent, an acceptance of the noise as a status quo. Um, so there won't necessarily be such a strong pushback uh, to introduce this vehicle. Uh, let's see. So the, the first phase is expected to rely on existing and in retrofitted infrastructure. Uh, and we then plan to expand out uh, based on aligning with development partners to build uh, uh, higher throughput vertiports. So the aircraft that we have designed as an overview, uh, I mentioned it is electric, it is vertical takeoff and landing. Uh, in terms of performance, uh, we are planning a range of up to 100 miles, but it is optimized specifically for 20 to 50, 50 mile rapid back-to-back -back trips uh, with minimal charge time. Uh, speeds of up to about 150 miles an hour and payloads of about a thousand pounds. So a one plus four uh, pilot plus four passengers with room for golf bags. The uh, the advantages, uh, safety first and foremost. That's our that's our primary concern. Um, the vehicle as a whole will be certified at levels similar to, to, to today's commercial uh, airliners, uh, but distinct from helicopters, there are no single points of failure. So the distributed electric propulsion systems that we are using. Uh, having multiple propulsors on the vehicle means that any one of them failing doesn't mean the vehicle is coming down. Uh, in terms of noise, we are uh, stating about 100 times quieter than a helicopter on, on average. Um, we are not yet ready to put precise numbers to that, but on order, we are about 20 dB quieter than a helicopter. More so uh, up on wing, we're uh, quite a bit quieter than, than a helicopter by 20 dB. Uh, and in terms of cost, we are about a third of the cost to manufacture and operate relative to a helicopter. All right, so let's get in some of the design of the vehicle itself. So there's a whole slew of factors that go into the design of the vehicle. Uh, any one division, any one group is going to say that theirs is important, uh, but it's a huge design space. And so where do you get started? What I alluded to in one of the first slides was the electrification enabling this technology. But as I said, it is also only just enabled this technology. So the really limiting thing, the thing that we need to focus on first is the performance, because that's the only thing that if it fails means that we will not have a viable product. So let's ask ourselves this question. Which one is more efficient, thrust borne or wing borne flight? I don't know why that other, there was a second image that came up. It's too bad. It's supposed to be a little helicopter right here. All right. Well, anyway, uh, let's imagine there's a there's a helicopter uh, under that first equation. Um, the idea is basically it's an inverse uh, relation between the two concepts. One has a large acceleration of a relatively small amount of air. Uh, in the in the case of a wingborne flight, you have a small acceleration for a large mass of air. Oh, there it is. All right. So, uh, starting from ideal power for hover. Uh, so just imagining that we are looking at some system that is going to be thrust borne. Uh, when we write out the equation for ideal power, uh, we can see that there is a term for area uh, in the denominator. What that means is that the larger the uh, uh, area of the rotor, the lower the ideal power. Uh, so you can just imagine you have more useful area with which to displace the air. Um, so that kind of describe that implies the the fall off in this curve. It's a, a one over n. Uh, as you can see along the x-axis, such that as you decrease the area of the individual propellers, the re power required goes up, and therefore the efficiency goes down. Um, that makes sense if you think about the area term itself, because really what you're doing is swapping an exponential, right, like a r squared, for just a linear n term. So in general, the area, the total area of the propellers will go down as you move away from a single uh, propeller. So in that sense, helicopters are the optimal solution for hover. That's why they were built. That's why they were designed that way. They're great at what they do. Uh, in terms of a vehicle as we are designing it, uh, that performance is going to sit somewhere in this tilt rotor uh, section right here. So not quite at the capability of a helicopter, but still pretty good and still much better than uh, the direct lift or lift fan concepts. Now, when we look at cruise power, uh, so uh, wingborne, 
Uh, we can write out this equation in terms of a lift over drag uh, term that, again, is in the denominator, which just says that when the uh, cruise efficiency is higher, the power goes down. That should make pretty good sense. Uh, and here we see that sort of the of the fall off of a helicopter, right? The, the, the cruise power of a helicopter uh, is very high because it has a poor lift to drag ratio. Conversely, something like a glider, which is just intended to stay up and cruise for a long period of time, uh, has a very low power requirement because of a high cruise performance efficiency. So uh, the vehicle we are designing will cut kind of in the middle of that. Uh, we will have a higher performance ratio than, than that of a helicopter and a lower performance than that of a glider. What that means in the summary is that we are taking the best of both worlds, right? Uh, we have hover performance that is nearly as good as a helicopter. Uh, we have cruise performance that is better than a helicopter, matching that of most uh, wingborne systems. And we should note that the majority of the time the, the vehicle is operating is wingborne, right? We're only considering these vertical maneuvers for a very short period of the, uh, the mission. So it would behoove us to use a lower cruise power. So that's why we have a wingborne concept. Now let's look at the blades. The aerodynamic models, uh, the, the design tools that we used are pretty traditional. Uh, you know, you start from geometric constraints, you consider op operational constraints. These things help to reduce the design space to understand what you can really actually affect and what you can really consider as, as options. Uh, what we've done uniquely is actually simply add noise minimization to our targets. So we are simply looking at aerodynamic de designs that also help to reduce the noise and meet our performance requirements. Uh, in terms of design tools, uh, our aero and acoustics teams have built a modular framework to support these multidisciplinary predictions. Um, so we've grouped together our uh, CAD for design, structural sizing, uh, CFD, and noise all together. Uh, this allows us to create a product that is truly fully optimized for the mission. All right, now a little bit of detail on the propellers. So uh, Midnight is somewhat unique, aside from being a eVTOL aircraft, in that we have two types of propellers. We have a uh, simply called a tilter, which tilts from a uh, you know vertical takeoff and landing uh, profile to a cruise position. Uh, we also have a lifter, which simply acts to lift the vehicle off the ground and then stows. Um, so in that case, the tilter has variable RPM uh, since it'll be uh, used through multiple phases of flight. In that same way, it'll have variable pitch uh, to allow for, like I said, takeoff and cruise conditions. Uh, and it is a relatively com complex propeller. Uh, the lifter, on the other hand, which is just intended to support us for uh, vertical takeoff and landing, uh, does also have variable RPM, but it is just fixed pitch. Uh, will stop in cruise and stow at a, a low drag configuration, and it is quite simple. Uh, acoustic considerations that went into these propellers, particularly on the tilter. Uh, so low tip speeds, uh, that is absolutely critical. That's the first order effect. That's what gets the overall noise levels down. Uh, but then we also need to consider the advance ratios, uh, the transitions and the edgewise flight. So we also in, uh, need to account for low advance ratios in transition and cruise. Uh, what this does is prevent the onset of this typical wop wop sound that you hear from a periodic change in the loading as you get uh, edgewise flight typical of a rotor. Um, so we have we have a low advance ratio, which means you get a very minimal wop wop effect. Uh, and as we move on to uh, onto wingborne flight, there is no edgewise cruise at all. We are now simply a propeller that has a nice clean inflow of air, uh, much lower noise. Uh, we have focused on minimizing the boom and wing interactions. Uh, there have been a number of studies that NASA has generated that uh, show that there are loading effects that uh, come in when you start mixing the inflow between a boom uh, and a, a blade or a wing that's that's interacting with it. Uh, we're minim minimizing self noise, right? So the the noise that's generated by ingestion of the wake generated by the by this propeller or a, a neighboring propeller. Um, and most uniquely, I would say, is our ability to now balance the tonal and the broadband components of the spectrum. When you're starting from a rotorcraft, the tonal component is absolutely dominant. Right, you're, you're at such a high tip speed that there is nothing about the broadband noise that you can really affect. It's really the tonal aspect that dominates uh, the whole character of the noise. When we bring the tip speeds down as low as we have, below 0.5, now we are able to actually play around with how tonal, how broadband is the acoustic signature of this propeller. 
terms of the lifters, uh, similar layout. So again, low speed, uh, low tip speeds in hover, uh, low advance ratios in transition. We are focusing to minimize the interaction between the, the tilter and the lifter. Of course, the lifter through transition will ingest a bit of the noise uh, and, and jet, ingest a bit of the wake uh, that's being produced by the tilter. Um, so we've uh, made efforts to minimize that interaction. Again, minimize the interaction with its own boom uh, and additionally balance the tonal and broadband components of the signal. Uh, so, what I've talked about is ways that we can minimize the noise of the propellers, minimize the noise of the vehicle, uh, and the next step, of course, layers of the onion, is ways to minimize the community noise. So, we, as a first order, reduce the impact by optimizing these trajectories. So, we take the very same uh, framework that we have in terms of aeroacoustics, our aerodynamics uh, and acoustic tool chain. We wrap into that our Volpe uh, advanced acoustic module, which allows us to generate uh, noise contours on the ground. This can then be utilized for multiple purposes. Uh, we have a operations and business case uh, simulation framework that allows us to design our business models, understand what markets we want to go into, how we design the routes, how we plan uh, the business case. Uh, and then we also have a optimization loop that we can now add because once we have these contours, once we know the contour areas, we can then feed that back into our system, understand what trajectories are giving us the highest noise, lowest noise, and optimize thusly. Um, at the bottom, you see just a couple example contours. Um, these, these are actually real contours we've generated. I've stripped out all the useful information, so they don't mean anything, um, but it does imply the significant change in areas that we are seeing uh, from this optimization. Uh, and lastly, noise abatement still applies. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean to, to, to dig on Teslas. Uh, it was just a, a easy access, but you know, in general, electric cars are very quiet. But when you drive them aggressively, in the case of plaid mode, which is like my favorite thing with Teslas, uh, they're much louder, right? So there, there's no idiot proof solution. You, you can design something to be quiet, and then you can still operate it in a loud manner. Um, so it is still very important for us, both as uh, designers of the vehicle and those responsible to train the pilots uh, to understand that noise abatement is still an important part of the operation of the vehicle uh, and how we interact with the public. So fly neighborly. Uh, and with that, I end with 26 seconds. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all of this information. And I know we do have a hard stop because there is a Tracon tour going on after this. So we can start the Q&A portion and we did get some great questions. Um, the first one is uh, for, I believe it's for Dr. Ashuk. How noisy are the supersonic engines during taxi and takeoff and will they be better or worse than stage five or lower engines and so what are the effects to the communities close into an airport thanks thanks for the question um so i think uh, uh two parts to this let me address the takeoff one first so as i mentioned you know one of our uh, key design constraints is uh, to achieve chapter 14 or stage five uh, LTO noise levels. And so uh, our design of overture, uh, you know, that's absolutely uh, one of the targets that we have to achieve, uh, that we are you know, setting for ourselves to achieve. Uh, for the taxi phase, um, you know, I, I think the uh, uh, one of the things about supersonic engines is uh, they are designed the kind of 100% thrust uh, setting is actually designed for top of climb. Uh, that's when the energy, uh, that's when you require the most amount of energy from the engine. And so at any uh, other um, phase of flight, uh, i.e. during uh, taxi, for example, you are actually operating at a lower thrust percentage uh, or throttle setting relative to other aircraft. So, you know, that should, I think, help in terms of alleviating some of the taxi phase noise as well. Great. Thank you. And we have uh, two questions here for Dr. Cruz. We're going to put these ones together. Uh, is the X-Wing X-59 being developed for civilian or military use? And what altitude do you expect these flights to be conducted at, the test flights? Start with the altitude question. Uh, I did have some supplemental slides that I didn't get to share. You can also check out the uh, Quest Mission website. Uh, but we expect to operate the X-59 at 55,000 feet uh, with about a speed of about Mach 1.4. Uh, that's about 925 miles per hour. As far as the uh, purpose for the development, it's for civil applications. Uh, the data we produce are to be consumed by the um, 
International Civil Aviation Organization committees, and you saw the word civil in the uh, current prohibition over land. So we're really trying to form uh, regulations surrounding uh, the operation of civil aircraft. Great, thank you. A question for um, Ben, is the lifter restarted for landing? And if so, when and how is that done? Yes, uh, certainly restarted for landing. Um, there is a sort of hysteresis uh, loop concept uh, uh, similar to the way it's implemented for some of the variable reduction systems in helicopters such that um, there is a range of RPMs over which the propeller will spin up uh, and maintain uh, it, it's RPM yeah, as, as you're as you're moving down in altitude, right? You're uh, you're decreasing the airspeed of the vehicle. The propellers will come on and stay on as that airspeed goes down. If you were to then increase airspeed again past some uh, threshold, the propellers would stop again. Okay, thank you. Uh, this question is for Joseph, but he's still with us. What's the biggest obstacle in getting the electric pipistrelle operating at other airports? Well, the hmm, biggest obstacle is really uh, infrastructure, electric charging infrastructure, which I think is going to be a that's going to be an obstacle for all electric aircraft, no matter what size they are. Um, good news is we're starting to see movement uh, within state governments and, and even the federal government about potentially providing some grant dollars to help uh, mitigate some of the cost of putting that infrastructure in place. You know, California is working right now on a solicitation, I think, for some funding uh, to do some projects uh, jointly with the CEC and the California Resources Board. So that's that's a big plus. And Washington State's already been working on this for a while. So infrastructure aside, then we get into the regulatory things. Um, you know, electric propulsion is um, accepted in Part 23 for Part 23 certification. And I know the FAA has been working on obviously a certification of the EV tolls and other, uh, an EC tall aircraft. I believe that uh, the FAA is going to probably uh, speed up uh, some of the regulatory uh, or smoothing out some of the regulatory barriers. We still have a regulatory barrier for light sport aircraft, which are actually a really good early, uh, um, early place for these aircraft to be actually implemented because the aircraft are light. Uh, they don't um, have as much weight, so the battery weights can be low, you know, not as large, and um, they can be they can be used uh, quite quite well in uh, pilot training. Great, thank you. And while we have you, I want to ask a follow up question: Which, how much um, cheaper would it be to get your private pilot certificate in a Pipistrelle than just in a traditional one seventy two? Ooh, um, well. Uh, typical 172 uh, cost, if, you know, in in the typical uh, scenarios these days, is about ten thousand to twelve thousand dollars to get your uh, pilot certificate uh, for a private pilot, assuming you get it in about fifty hours or so. And uh, for a uh, Pipistrel Alpha Electro, it could be uh, about a third of that easily could be uh, cut. Uh, it could be cut by down to about a third or two thirds of that cost could be uh, eliminated. The Alpha Electro will operate uh, for an hour on about five dollars worth of electricity. Um, a one seventy two burning eight gallons an hour at six dollars and forty cents a gallon. Yeah, you can kind of do the math, right? And that's uh, that's just for the fuel. And there's no oil to change. Um, yeah, there's no spark plugs to change. The electric propulsion just has a huge advantage from a cost savings perspective, which is, of course, why a lot of the, uh, you know, the EV tolls are, are going to be amazing. And uh, they're going to really, really help, um, you know, in terms of uh, lowering cost of moving people uh, short distances. Great. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Ben. Are you planning a San Francisco to San Jose route? And have you reached out to anyone in San Mateo or Santa Clara counties? And if you did this, would you be staying over the bay the entire way? Well, uh, a couple parts to that. Uh, yes, we are uh, planning, certainly certainly planning uh, multiple routes within the Bay Area. Uh, I don't have the contact information for any of those uh, the 
administrative contacts within the area, but uh, I can put anybody that's interested in touch with our people who would know. Uh, and the last question was, the last portion of that was. Let me see. I already cleared it. The last portion was, are you going to stay over the bay the entire time? That was right. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, no direct plan um, to do that. We we may leverage that as, as a means of, uh, you know, ease of access into the market. Um, but the plan is to not necessarily need to uh, stay over those routes. The whole, the whole point is that we are trying to move into denser urban environments and not rely on these uh, circuitous routes to, to minimize noise. All right, this question is for Nathan. For people in your testing, for your testing area, are you going to be testing areas that have current aviation noise or areas that aren't exposed to aviation noise? And how would you define how people are exposed to noise? Sure. There's definitely an intention to uh, reach populations that are not routinely subjected to aviation noise. Uh, in terms of how one could uh, distinguish those, uh, would have to be based on some distance threshold from an airport, for example, and uh, you could uh, kind of overlap that with the recruitment region. And so those who are inside that airport ring may may meet the definition of exposed to airport noise, whereas those outside uh, would be identified as not routinely exposed. Uh, part of the nuance in uh, uh, the, the demographic selection too, there's an intention to visit uh, kind of a mix of urban and uh, rural settings as well too. So we, we definitely want to expose uh, broad swaths of the U.S. population uh, to this new uh, sonic thump that we're, that we're trying to measure right and, and engage perceptions. And for uh, Akshay, how can communities be sure that the VNRS will be used during regular operations? Wouldn't the aircraft be louder if it were disabled to turned off? Thanks, Tim. Uh, and yeah, thanks to whoever asked the question. I think that's a very pertinent question uh, to to what you know uh, to, to what is uh, kind of inherently you know required to be able to meet those noise levels. So it's a question that we've actually been uh, uh, asked even by you know regulators and you know even within ICAO CAPE and things like that. So uh, the VNRS uh, is envisioned to be a an integral part of the. Uh, procedural, um, uh, you know, processes within the takeoff cycle for overture. Uh, and so, you know, contrast with maybe some of the uh, options that uh, currently exist for subsonic aircraft, such as D-rates and things like that, um, you know, this is kind of a little bit different in that it, it's, it's um, you know, it's part of the takeoff uh, process um, and, uh, you know, it can only be kind of deactivated if absolutely needed under like safety circumstances, for example. So, um, you know, that's kind of the the way we envision to implement it. Um, you know, there are uh, there's scope for uh, you know it, it it's also likely not um, uh, you know th 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 there are kind of a minimum level uh, of VNRS profiles that we need to achieve the noise levels, but then. Um, you know, there is potentially some uh, leeway there as well for even more stringent, um, uh, you know, kind of lower noise profiles if the aircraft uh, is capable. So, for example, if it's not fully loaded uh, and you have a long enough runway and things like that, then you can even, you know, think about tuning it even further um, should the case arise. I can expand on that. Uh, from a higher level, the FAA doesn't permit uh, VNRS systems or anything that's called a VNRS system if there is the option to turn it off, right? So those those systems are not things that the pilot would have the ability to turn, to turn off. Otherwise, you would assume the worst case scenario. Barring the safety implication, of course. Yes. Thank you. Um, an additional question, Mr. Goldman, as routes get established, what type of outreach has Archer done to engage the communities or will do to engage the communities that will serve and fly over? Great question. Um, so just in the last few months, we invited a, a, the whole group of uh, uh, local community members to come out, uh, witness our subscale maker vehicle uh, flying and operating over the Salinas Airport. Um, so that is a first order, just introducing them to the, the concept of what an eVTOL is. We are uh, further planning 
uh, engagement with the cities and the cities that we've already publicly announced. So New York and Chicago, uh, we are actively engaging uh, grassroots campaigns to, uh, in, in a similar thread, uh, introduce those communities to the vehicle, uh, introduce them to the concept and the operations that we are uh, planning to operate. I think we have about we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I believe this question is for um, Akshay. What metrics will you use to assess the noise impacts? Uh, sure. I mean, we we are kind of uh, using or we are you know following what what's currently established in terms of uh, noise metrics and and measurement uh, requirements. I mean, certainly uh, within the LTO, there are you know it's a lateral. Uh, um, kind of sideline approach and downwind uh, points that you know as as are required uh, for current operations. So we kind of follow that um, for, for for our impact measurement. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that that answers. Um, question for Ben: Can you address low frequency noise and how you are um, designing? For low, designing to address low frequency noise in your in your aircraft, um, as opposed to compared to helicopters. Uh, sure. So, uh, the reason why uh, helicopters experience such intense low frequency noise um, is that they have typically a low blade count at a very high uh, uh, rate of rotation that introduces these relatively low frequency uh, uh, introductions of a blade passage. Right, so uh, what you're what you're doing is you're not actually experiencing the noise specifically of the blade, but actually the passage of the blade. So it's getting louder as it passes the advancing side of of the of the, the propeller disc, and so what you're hearing is this beating pattern. Um, that is the low frequency content that is typically most disturbing. That's the thing that when a helicopter is coming at you at 100 knots, you can hear from a mile out. Uh, the whole reason. Uh, that I was leaning on the the concept of avoiding edgewise flight is exactly that. Uh, when you have no edgewise uh, uh, rotation of the blade, you don't get the loading oscillations that you would from a helicopter, and therefore what you instead get is a frequency drone that is just dependent on the rotation rate, um, but much more akin to a, a traditional fixed wing uh, prop than the beat of a helicopter. This is a, I guess, two-part question for Dr. Ashok. What, what do you expect the airfare to be for a flight from New York to London, for example? And how fuel efficient will, will supersonic flight be compared to commercial flights of the same size? Thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> so on on airfares, uh, you know, we are kind of targeting this um, to be comparable with current business class fares. Um, that's the expectation for the first version of Overture anyway. Uh, I, I will make, make a note that, you know, we are just an OEM or an aircraft manufacturer. And so, you know, ultimately airlines are the ones who will be setting those prices and, you know, doing uh, doing it with their own business case and things like that. Uh, but we do expect our, our aim is to make it kind of profitable, um, you know, uh, at the starting level, but then also continually improve that uh, to make to widen it, make it more accessible. Uh, on the fuel efficiency side, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. So we've done uh, you know, a number of studies um, and, uh, you know, for a comparable product uh, relative to subsonics, uh, we anticipate between two and three times uh, the fuel burn. So, you know, it, it is absolutely right that there is, um, you know, increased energy requirement for supersonic flight um, in order to be able to achieve those time savings. Um, what I will note, though, is, you know, if you look back uh, historically, I mean, the, you know, we are, we, are, we are kind of entering new entrants as it were. And so, uh, you know, there's, I, I fully expect that there will be a continued scope to improve the design and improve the fuel efficiency performance, um, you know, as, uh, you know, designs get iterated as the technology matures um, in a broad sense for supersonics. Okay, thank you. And our final question, Ben, as the final speaker, you get the final question. When are you expecting to have first flights outside of the testing phase? Uh, if we're speaking operationally, the intent is to uh, start operating within the markets we have discussed uh, with uh, as early as 2025. 
Great. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists again. Really appreciate it. And I will turn this over to Sandra. If we have any, or Justin, if we have any final comments. <laughs>